I can't sing. <laughs> no? Oh, yeah, that's right. You're going to play an instrument. Yeah, why don't you sing for me? You're the one that can sing. Um, let me see. What can I sing to you? Okay, I got one. Okay. Are you ready? Uh huh. Okay. Among the many terms and phrases scattered across the internet, one that is used frequently is the term locale. This describes someone who is being made fun of in mass for the actions they take, despite not trying to be funny. The most recent mainstream example of a locale you might be thinking of is Chris Chan. There are people on the internet um, that have uh, sort of created like huge hate communities around them, and they usually somewhat deserve it. I'm talking about guys like DSP, Wings of Redemption, obviously Chris Chan, you know, people that have developed these massive, not just hate communities, but like cultures surrounded around every mistake they've ever made on the internet. I like to look into a lot of these internet sort of train wrecks from time to time. It's hard to look away, and anybody that makes internet related content will tell you that they know all about Chris Chain. They, they've heard about it, okay? If they haven't been this invested into it, they've at least heard of it. Very few people, I would say, are actually like fans of Chris Chan. Uh, they're more observers and, uh, what would you say? Trolls and just people who are entertained by lol cows. I'm not sure what you would call someone who's just entertained by lol cows. They don't necessarily want to troll them or they just kind of want to laugh at them because they think it's like weird and interesting how crazy they are. Chris Chan is the absolute best example of a low cow. This person has been duped into doing many things that you wouldn't believe, only for the amusement of everyone willing to listen. And all the while, they stay almost completely unaware of their large meme status they have on the internet. Although I could make a 60 part series on Chris Chan, I have another tale for you. Today we'll be discussing one of the greatest locales to have ever graced the internet. A person whose incredibly fascinating and entertaining story from a private citizen to a laughingstock for a small community has been lost to time. A tale of corruption, false realities, and some good old chicken pot pie. This is Lauren Armstrong and the Legacy of Cod. The next is, uh, how did you first find out about the Church of Claude? Well, it's like, and shit that she was going to go on a date with a doctor and all this other shit. And... I'm not going to know everything. Your whole life is fucked. It's like the stands through the hourglass. Here's Lauren's life. Hey, Lauren. Morning. It's still hard for me to grasp why people be so interested in me because I don't feel any different than anyone else. And it's shocking. Whether you believe me or not, I want to change. I don't like the person that I've been. Our adventure starts on October 18th, 1970, in the sleepy town of Cambridge, Maine. Here we find the birth of a male child, who was given the name Lauren Lynn Armstrong. Lauren was born into a family as the youngest of six, four brothers, one sister, and himself. As he was the youngest child, he always looked up to his siblings and held them up on a pedestal that they probably shouldn't have been on. He also recognized at a young age how much pain and trouble his mother had to go through just to raise him and his siblings. Gwendolyn Armstrong, commonly referred to as Mama Gwen, has been through divorces, has been cheated on, and had to raise her six kids to the best of her ability. Lorne praised his mother for how strong she's been 
and placed her above everything and everyone. Yeah. Calling my mother a bitch is one way to fucking make me not happy. I'm sorry, so, baby. For I'm you, sorry. For you to not have me. Oh, come on. You you're talking about, you're talking about a fucking, you were talking about a fucking 77 year old woman that never did a fucking thing to you. I am tired of your bullshit about you. my mom. You don't fucking like my mom, then you don't like me. If you don't like that response, then you suck it up on your own. Lord would go on to have a troubling childhood, as his early life would be filled with key figures in his life, like his father, leaving him and his family while he was young. Despite this, Lord would describe his childhood as good, but also recognize that he has problems with people leaving him due to both his father's absence and his siblings heading off to college while he was young. He craved for more attention as a child and was taught to always be honest a trait that he would forget in his later years. Lorne also deeply cares about how people view him, which is something you'll witness for yourself later on. He grew up in Shohegan, Maine for the majority of his young life, and other than what I've mentioned previously, he had a pretty straightforward life, attending school and trying to be the best little Lorne he could possibly be. On June 9, 1989, Lorne barely graduated high school with a C average, ranking last out of all of his classmates, and decided to join the Air Force as a mechanic two years later in April of 1991. During this time, while he was stationed in Anchorage, Alaska, Lorne was trained to be a truck mechanic and was also part of the decontamination team. He was in charge of a Minimite basketball team, receiving an award for his voluntary action. He also broke his right arm and dislocated his wrist during service. Also during this time in Alaska, Lorne met a girl named Paula. We know very little about Paula, but according to Lorne, they had sex once and their relationship ended around a year once Lorne discovered that she was also having sex with other guys. Why am I telling you about some random hookup? Well, for two reasons. Reason number one is that this sets up some patterns you'll see later on. Reason number two is that Lauren talks about her pretty frequently and uses Paula as an example of how poorly he was treated in a relationship. I've never given anybody else a ring. That's not true. No, that is true. You told me you bought a ring from Paula. <laughs> no, I, I said I thought about, thought about buying a ring from Paula. And I wound up talking to my friend Jim about it that I worked for, that he lived right next door, and he met Paula too, and he talked me out of it. Why? Because she wasn't in love with you, Ellie? Um, she did love me. How do you know? But, um, she told me. She told me I'll, I'll say when I told her that I had thought about buying her a ring. Because she don't told love me you I'll say, No, she told me I was straight not to do it because she actually would marry me. <laughs> Why would she tell you not to then? It's stupid. Um, because she, she was a wild child and didn't want to be married, evidently. She just wanted your cock? No. Yep. But she only got it once. She didn't get it in ever again after that. You were she gonna to, fucking I... marry her after you only boned her once? Well, I, well, I only boned her once, but I already knew her for a year. I had spent a lot of time with her. One year and seven months of service later, Norn was discharged from the Air Force because he failed a trade course test and was told that he wasn't cut out for the military. The highest rank he earned was Airman First Class, also known as E3, and because of not meeting the requirement, he did not qualify for any veteran benefits. After his departure from the military in 1993, Lauren headed to Washington State, 
living in both Washington State with his brother, his brother's wife, and his nieces, and living in Maine where he was originally. Now that Lauren is fresh out of the military and constantly shifting between two places of residence, it's about time he gets himself a job and some steady income. I'm going to quickly run through all of the jobs Lauren acquired between the years 1994 and 2005, and then we'll continue from there. From February 5th to May 17th of 1994, Lauren worked with Irving Tanning Company located in Heartland, Maine as a laborer. Lauren was rehired at Irving Tanny Company as a laborer from October 19, 1998 to August 19, 1999. After that, at some point, Lauren sold Kirby vacuums in Washington with an unknown company for about two to three months. Lauren then quit this job because he was broke, and in 1999, he worked with Snyder National as an over-the-truck driver for six months. He then quit his job at Snyder National because he did not enjoy the lifestyle, and from late 1999 to 2001, Lauren was employed by A Plus Septic Service, located in Lancy, Washington, where he drove the trucks, ran the pumps, and did repairs. After his job at A Plus Septic Service, Lauren decided to move back to Maine permanently and open his own A1 Septic Service business in 2001. From July 24, 2002 to August 22, 2002, Lauren was rehired again at Irving Tanning Company as a laborer, and on July 19, 2005, Lauren was rehired at Irving Tanning Company for the fourth and final time. He would quit his job that same day, and the company stated that they would not consider re-employing him. Now that we know where Lauren was working between the years 1994 and 2005, it's time we talk about the other thing that took up a majority of his time. A person, actually. And her name was Amanda James. In 2000, while working with A Plus Septic Service, Lauren started to become acquainted with the internet and soon found himself in a relationship with a person claiming to be a 28-year-old woman named Amanda James. Just like Paula, little is known about Amanda's personality, but her presence and impact on Lauren's life cannot be ignored. Lauren gave Amanda money and Dale Earnhardt Jr. memorabilia to make her happy and to display his affection towards her. Lauren then decided to move back to Maine in 2001 permanently to be closer to her as she lived in Pennsylvania. That by the way is probably the reason why Lauren quit the A plus septic service job. Since he permanently moved back to Maine, he can't possibly maintain his job in Washington and just decides to open his own septic business. After returning to Maine where a large part of Lauren's family lives, he met up with his sister, told her about his relationship with Amanda James and about the niece that Amanda had custody over. Naturally, Lauren's sister would want to talk to Amanda James, so Lauren's sister and Amanda James had a very brief two-minute conversation. Somehow, Lauren's sister found out that Amanda was a catfish and had been lying to Lauren the entire time. Her real name was apparently Leslie, and her niece was actually her daughter. It bothers me. And I'll tell you why it bothers me is because of fucking Amanda James. Her real name is Leslie M lives in Pennsylvania. If I look at the fucking map, I can even tell you what town she lives in because I'll remember. And just as soon as I see the fucking town's name, I will fucking remember. She told me her fucking daughter was her niece. She told me she had custody of her dog, of her niece because her fucking mother was a, 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 a fucking drug addict and her sister-in-law died of breast cancer and she had custody of her niece. For two fucking years, Two fucking years. I never went on a goddamn date because of that bitch. This of course hit Lauren pretty hard since their relationship was two years long. 
In that time span, he completely stopped dating and dedicated his attention solely to Amanda James, a girl he had never met and had strictly been talking to online. Despite knowing that she had lied to him, Lauren continued to talk to Amanda for six months after they broke up, with conversations coming to a halt by the middle of 2002. This situation will affect Lauren for the remainder of his life and something he won't forget, as it's the second example, after Paula, of how he was treated poorly. Um, I was over in Washington State. I started, that's when I started going on the internet. When you lived in Washington State, you started going on the internet and what happened? I met a girl, and she said her name was Amanda James, and she told me that, that her, her daughter was her niece, and that she was watching her niece. Well, she was actually had custody of her niece. And then? Um, three, uh, three years later, I moved back to Maine just to be close to her because she lived in Pennsylvania. And I didn't, I didn't date anyone, I didn't see anyone because of her. All right, so what happened? I got back to Maine and I was talking to her on the phone and she, uh, my sister wanted to say hi to her and my sister had been on the internet for a couple of years and she was able to read people pretty good. And what happened? And she got on the phone with her, and she, uh, after she got off the phone, she was only on the phone with her for about two minutes, and she got off the phone with her and told me that, uh, told me that she wasn't real. She wasn't real? She told me she was lying to me, and she'd been lying to me all along. Did you ever meet this woman? Did you send her money? I sent her money, I sent her... All kinds of Dale Earnhardt things. Dale Earnhardt things. Dale Earnhardt Jr. things. She was Dale. The race car driver. Yeah. When coming across your typical locale, you might first think that the mockery and public humiliation they receive is unwarranted. However, upon further inspection, the typical locale usually has done things, either currently or in their past, that would be considered cruel or unjust. Some of these things might be as simple as lying or stealing, but other times, the locale would do horrendous things that you'd find hard to even stomach, making the locale not only a terrible person, but a person who you won't find sympathy for, even when they are the butt end of a joke. This is no different for Lauren. I like to call this part of the story, Why People Don't Like Lauren Armstrong, where in these three separate events between the years 2004 and 2007, Lauren shows how malicious he can truly be, and where people lose sympathy for the locale. In 2004, Lauren decided to browse country music chat rooms something he would begin to do more often after he became more familiar with the internet. There he would find and start talking to two underage girls, who shall be referred to as MySpace Girl Number 1 and MySpace Girl Number 2. Let's begin with MySpace Girl Number 2, who started talking to Lauren when she was 16 years old. As they began talking, Lauren claimed that he had slight romantic feelings for this girl, but never proceeded to go anywhere with them. Yeah. She was in Maine. So she I was in Maine? Too. Yeah, she had a lot of problems. And how did you meet her? On the internet. She was in a jail room. In the country, I think she was in the country music room or a main room or something like that. It was 16, I think she was 16. Okay. Okay. And she was feeling really down about herself when I met her. Mm -hmm. But nobody wanted her. She kept saying she was ugly and all that. She showed me a picture of her and I didn't know that. She, that she, I said, you're not ugly. I said, you're a beautiful girl. I said, and there's some boy there at the area school that likes you. He's just probably too shy to say it. Mm -hmm. I remember I said that to her. And she 
became friends from there. There was never really that much sexual stuff between me and before you even ask it. I know what you're going to ask now. Why not? I don't know. Because we were just friends. Yeah, but you were saying that you were feeling romantic toward her. Yeah. I wasn't the same person back then either. That is until three years later when MySpace girl number two came over to Lauren's trailer one random day. She and a friend just sat around with a drunk Lauren and his drunk friend until they left. And after that, they slowly stopped talking. Um, and then, did you ever meet her? I did. Okay. Her, her and a friend came over to meet me. One there. It was actually came over to New York. Over, over to my house. They went to your yeah. house? Yeah, but she was, she, I think she was like 19 at the time that she came over. So you so, talked to her for two years? I think I, yeah, I think I actually talked to her for three years, I think. Okay, so when she came over to your house, what happened then? Nothing. She, her and her friend sat in the chair and, and me talked to them for a little bit, and then they left. It was around her age. Was around think, whose age? I think I think it was around. Actually, I think it was a year older than them. I think. When she ended up coming over to your house, yeah. What happened there? I was drunk. I was drunk. Okay. She had a pregnant girlfriend. Girlfriend with her, and we just talked. Then get drunk too? No. Oh, she didn't. No. The two boys two were drunk, older. and that was it. Yeah, it was actually, two years old because it was twenty-one. She was 19 when her and her girlfriend came over. Okay, so you talked to each other for three years before she came over? Yeah. Why do you think it took that long? Why? Um, yeah. Because, I don't know, I just did. I really planned it. So what she made had, you want her to had, come over that night? I didn't even know that she was coming over that night. How did that happen then? She and her and her friend showed up. Oh, you had I given her... her your address before? My address, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I told her if she ever wanted to come over, then she could. I gave my address. Okay. And I, don't, or I guess she wrote it down. And she just showed up one day. But you guys were still talking at that point. Yeah, we were still talking at that point. We didn't talk much after that because it wasn't long after that, that she moved out to either Wisconsin or Montana or somewhere out there. And then what were you feeling when, when she came over? I mean, did you want to kiss her or something? Like, you had well, already had these... Okay. I gave her a hug. She gave me a hug. I even gave her a friend a hug. Okay. But I felt awkward because I didn't know if she was going to show up and, and me were drunk. This, of course, is a very alarming story, but it only gets worse for MySpace girl number one. MySpace girl number one was only 15 years old when she started talking to Lauren in 2004. After talking for a brief amount of time, they had started dating. Lauren, you were friends with the little girl on MySpace? Well, well she, she was 15 when, when I met her. She was 19 last time I talked to her. This is when I got incarcerated before that. How did you become friends with her? I met her on the uh, country music chat room. She was from Maine. So they had country music chat rooms for every state. You could go to different states, and they'd have country music chat rooms in every state. And me and her would try to be boyfriend and girlfriend. But with the way she acted, she was just too young at the time, and, and we, we both talked about it and decided not to. I was a good friend of four years. Well, but you said that you were going to try to be boyfriend and girlfriend with her. Did you already tell her that you loved her and all that stuff? No, not right off the bat. Well, no, not right off the bat, but while you were still talking to her, because you, you were already about 32. Yeah. And she was 15, so... I'm wondering if the conversation was pretty much the same as what was happening here. No, with me, it was completely different. She, she talked to me about her boyfriend and her 
family and problems okay. in the family. I was, I was the one that she would talk to about all of her problems. And right. So there was there was more conversation there. Obviously, we know Kayla was there just to be like a shell of a teenage girl and was a real girl. So she's going to have more going on in her life. Yeah. I'm just curious how the boyfriend and girlfriend situation came up between the two of you. That was just at the beginning. How did that start? I know you're saying that you were in a country music chat room. So how did it start that you guys were going to be boyfriend and girlfriend? Well, we started, we started talking. That it wasn't the first night. I don't okay. Know exactly when, but but I sang and she liked my singing and she liked well, she's asshole to get up like Kenny Chesney. And I used to sing songs that she liked. Okay. She she liked Kenny Chesney. This relationship lasted for about four months, right until it reached a climax. MySpace girl number one and Lauren planned to meet each other near the end of the first year they've been talking for. Well, not actually meet. According to Lauren, there was a state fair going on near MySpace Girl Number One's hometown, so they planned on both going to the fair just to see each other, not talk, but just look at each other to verify that they were both talking to real people. We tried to see each other one other time when we were in the first year that we met. It was okay. like towards the end of the first year that we met. We tried to see okay. each other, but I, I went up to see her. But I brought somebody with me. I brought somebody with me because we we're just going to see each other. We weren't even going to talk to each other. We weren't even going to touch each other or nothing. We we're just going to see each other because we, want, we both wanted to know that we both existed. That, that doesn't matter either. That's even it's, creepier, it's, it's, Lauren. You went to stalk her? You didn't even want to let her know you were no. watching her? Dude, come on. It was a mutual thing. She wanted to see me too. So what did you do? Just like drive by and wave or something? No, well, there was supposed to be some fair going on or something like that. We weren't even going to meet. We just wanted to see each other. What's the point? You guys were just going to spend all that gas money to wave after you had been very close and in a relationship that you said you felt committed? Lauren, I can you please help me make sense of that? I just don't get it. You're not that just desperate. Cause we, just because we cared about each other. At the time, we cared about each other. And we wanted to see that the other one was real. Did she have concerns that you weren't real? She had concerns at the same time that I did. My my concern was because of what happened with Amanda James. Didn't you see her on cam? What did, what did you think you were looking at then? It, we it's saw each other on cam, but I, I don't know. I guess we just both just wanted to feel better about knowing the other one. So Lauren took his pal Tony with him as a witness, and they drove three and a half hours to the fair. So whose not, idea was not, it to do this? I'm, I'm not lying to you at all about this. Who was the one who was nervous? I, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember if it was my idea or if it was hers. And I, I brought somebody with me to make sure that that I was safe. That I, what did I you think was going to happen? Um, I, didn't think, I didn't think anything was going to I didn't know what was going to happen. I just brought somebody with me for my own security. So you wanted to make sure that if you had someone with you and you go to a fair, that's like a public place, there's a lot of people around, there's a chance that you could have just been going there. It just so happened that you were both there at the same time, but it wasn't to see each other in case it ended up like a situation like to catch a predator. No, in, in case it wound up where somebody said something about me being somewhere, I had witnessed that I was right there with that person. Once there, MySpace girl number one admits to Lauren that she got the event date wrong, so Lauren and Tony showed up a day before the fair was planned to take place. Lauren couldn't stay another day because he had to work the next day, so they never actually met. So then after you saw what happened? I didn't see her. Oh, she wasn't there? No, she, uh, she said the fair was supposed to be one day, but she got that day wrong. She asked oh. me asked me if I could stay another day, and I said, no, I said, I got to work, so I never got to see her. Oh, okay. Tony, however, did talk to MySpace girl number one on the phone at some point during this trip. After their conversation, Tony told Lauren that she sounds like a very nice girl, but they probably shouldn't be dating each other. 
three and a half hours away from me. She lived in, so that's where I drove from, was from Cambridge. Okay. Tony was the one that went with me. Tony thought that I should be waiting to talk to her until she was 18, but he, after he talked to her a little bit. He didn't talk to her very much, but he talked to her a little bit. And he said that, that she seems like a nice person to be friends with. But he, he did say that, that he thought that I still should wait until she's 18 to talk to her, or to meet her. Okay. Not to talk to her, but to meet her. But were they aware of how old she was at the time? Yes. Okay. They told me also that I need, I need to leave her alone for three years. Okay. But then this person wound up talking to Molly too and said she didn't, she, she, yeah, good person for you to be friends with. Even though she doesn't rage, she'd be a good person to be friends with because she can sound like she was honest and she was sincere. Okay. And she was. She was very, she was very, very honest and very, very sincere. So, so he became friends with Molly too? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, kind of. Was he, was he a chatter too, just like you were? No. After their attempted meetup, and after receiving some advice from Tony, Lauren and MySpace Girl Number 1 talked about their relationship and decided to wait until she was of age and out of high school to try it again. They continued to speak to each other for three years, all the way up to 2007. Lauren was now in Nashville, for a reason you'll figure out in a moment, and MySpace Girl Number 1 planned on going to Nashville to meet Lauren after she graduated. Fortunately, these plans never happened. Communication between MySpace Girl Number 1 and Lauren started to slow down drastically in early September of 2007, and communication would completely stop on October 18, 2007. 16 started getting a little better when she was 17. Then 18, she was, once she graduated, she would, after she graduated, she was going to come out of Nashville. Okay. So, when you were talking to Kayla... You were talking to him at the same time? Well, when I was talking, yeah, I was, I was talking some. I wasn't talking to her very much, though. But there was still a plan for her to come down and be with you? No, not be with me, to visit with me. Okay. But as far as being, there was no plans for us to be boyfriend and girlfriend. But she was going to come down and visit me. Um, whatever happened, happened. What changed the boyfriend and girlfriend thing? And just over time, things change. And, you know, we have to know each other better in a better way and it was hard to tell what was going to happen with us it says not recording so I'm going to tell you no. this, this one thing we had strong feelings for each other what does that mean? meaning when I, well she was 18 we missed the well, but when I was down in Nashville she was going to come down to Nashville to see me and we were going to try something then to be clear here these are real victims of Lauren Armstrong Lauren has claimed to not only have romantic feelings for these girls, but also has revealed himself and talked sexually to them on multiple occasions. Okay. Did you feel like she was your girlfriend at some point? No. No. Okay. So then what was the sexual stuff? What was what? What was the sexual stuff? You said it didn't get, there wasn't a lot of sexual stuff. Yeah. No, we we just talked sexually a little bit. I showed myself to work a time or two. When you were naked? Yeah. Okay. That Is that nice. while you guys were talking about sexual stuff? Yeah. Okay. This is where we see Lauren's true colors as a very dangerous individual. But of course, it does it in there. It's late 2006. This year would be very eventful for a certain married couple. Betty and her husband Eric decided to move from Rhode Island and come to Maine to live a quiet, peaceful country life. Almost immediately after moving to Maine, the couple made the decision to renovate their house. To be more precise, they had moved their mobile home to a large, inhabited piece of land in Maine and planned on building a house around said mobile home. Of course, with such a large task, you need people to help build and facilitate the construction. 
This is where Betty and Eric enter a sort of construction hell, where people would order items for the job and others would work on certain portions of the home, but nothing would really get done. So that brings us to uh, to y'all deciding that you wanted to uh, make it to Maine, and and that was 2006. And of course, we know from from the book of Durango that uh, that that's comes up right to the time that you met Lauren. So it would have been uh, it was I mean it was right when y'all got there, wasn't it? That you um, it yeah, it wasn't too long afterwards, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, some of our some of our listeners, of course, will be familiar with it already, since we've you know details uh, in the book of Durango and everything. But um, if you will, why don't you tell us how you had occasion to hire him? Uh, what what originally brought him on onto the scene? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, we did have some other people planned that we had planned to um, work here. Mm-hmm. On, on this property um, but it wasn't and that man had ordered the lumber mm-hmm. and um, the roof trusses which we'll get into later and um, so there was there was material here but the fellow that was do was to do the work, it's kind of dragging his feet. He had other things. He had other irons in the fire. He was doing other stuff. He was the he was the fellow who actually moved the mobile home up to this site. Oh, okay. Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. So he was in the prime. He also was doing that business, and, and see, he didn't have uh, he didn't have the time. And we were getting into very cold months now. You know, we're 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 into November. At this As they waited for one guy in particular to clear up his schedule, Betty and Eric needed assistance with hooking up a washing machine, so they took to the yellow pages to find someone to help them out. After looking for a short while, she stumbled upon a business named A1 Septic Service and Construction. Very generic of a name if you ask me, but they only need a washing machine hooked up, so it shouldn't matter much. This business was also local, which was helpful and probably influenced their decision. Unfortunately for the couple, the business with the title A1 Septic Service and Construction is actually owned and ran by Lauren Armstrong. It was, I I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head right now, but we started to get some stuff that one of the, we had one person come in at least and close the skirting so that we wouldn't have the pipes freezing. Yeah. And he did that, and that was that was fine, but that was not worn. Right. That was from the, up the road here. Now, um, fast forward to we get our equipment, uh, uh, our washer and our, and our our dryer. Finally, we didn't have one when we were living in um, in a trailer in Rhode Island because we were on a lake. You know, I I was there for twenty years. Uh, I had to go to a laundromat. Mm-hmm. This was like so when we ordered one of those LG setups, I mean it was overkill because there was just the two of us. But because it was so many years that I hadn't used a washing machine in my own home, it's a great big thing. Yeah. Now that's where we looked in the yellow pages, and we were looking for someone to hook up the washer. And the wash uh, in the A1 Septic was the name of the place that was local. Mm-hmm. It was a two, uh, 277 number, just like ours. So we um, said, well, that's good. The guy is local. So we called that number, and that was Lauren. So Lauren came down to hook up the washing machine for the two cowboys and ended up striking a conversation with the both of them. Betty had expressed how it's been a hassle trying to get someone to renovate their house. And Lauren tells them that he has built a house before and that he does really good construction. Um, He was supposed to come and set up the washing machine. Okay. In the process of talking to him, because he was an outgoing person, he he chatted very easily. Yeah. Was seemed to be a likable enough person. He was quite a prolific chatter, you might say. Prolific chatter. You know what? I almost (laughs) said that and I said, no, I'm not going to. 
<laughs> yes, he was a pro prolific chatter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and he told Eric and me that, wow, well, that's what I used to do. I, you know, I, I was trying to get this house built, but it's not happening. Oh, well, I, I did that. That was my job. I was a construction worker. Hmm. Uh, I do this on the side, blah, blah, blah. And, and so he said, too bad. And he said, too bad I didn't know before you hired this other guy. So Eric and I talked about it, and we said, well, let's find out if the first guy uh, was, was going to be available, when he was going to be available. And he admit, we called him, and he admitted that he had too much going on. He just couldn't do it. And he agreed to just forget about it, and we hired Lauren. Yeah. That's how it started. After some more conversation, Lauren gets hired to work on Betty and Eric's property. Things were strained for Betty after that, as when she told other people that Lauren Armstrong was working on her property, she didn't get the best reception. And because we are from away and he was not, townspeople didn't really want to say too much. I understand that. Yeah. They're not going to say something about their own people. Yeah. But on a couple of occasions, when... um. We told a couple of people in the area who was working on our house. One man said, well, first he rolled his eyes. That was his giveaway. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of went, <sighs> which was another giveaway. And then he said, I said to him, what? Um, uh, nothing. No, really, what? What? Is there something we should know? Yeah. He said, well, just watch him. Soon enough, though, Warren and his crew, which consisted of himself, his brother Paul, and his friend Tony, started working on the house. Once they began, it was downhill from there. The next time he came back, he had those other two guys with him. Um... Now, neither one was his was a brother, uh, to your knowledge, yeah, is there? One of them is a brother. Okay, so one of them was a brother, okay. And one of them was one some them, other guy. I'll tell you their names. I don't know if it really matters. Uh, one of them was Paul Okay. Trump, and the other fellow was... Tony. Tony Farmer. Yeah. They're cutting the board. They're cutting the lumber. Okay. One guy, one guy is cutting lumber. The other two are watching him smoking a cigarette. There's nice. nothing else for them to do while he cuts that one board. Unbelievable. Not unbelievable. Totally believable. It sounds like you're basically dealing with three Lorns. And that, when I called that lumber company, and the guy told me it was going to rain in my house. Do you remember me telling you that? Yeah, you can tell it again if you got the time, because I know people I would do. be interested in hearing it. It's not very long. Uh, <laughs> I can't tell you what it was that he ordered, mm -hmm. um, but I had the list in front of me, and I read it to the man at the lumber store, at the um, building store, and he said to me, what are you doing with this stuff? Yeah. I, we're putting an addition on on our uh, home, our mobile home, and this is for the, uh, the addition. This is... Uh, for the roof. Uh, he said, Lady, it's going to rain in your house. Mm. He said, You need, I can't think of it, a certain type of insulation that's called water and water and ice, which he didn't order. He ordered just a regular type of insulation, I guess. Or And, and the man, the way he explained it to me is, What you're ordering is going to absorb moisture and it's going to continue to absorb moisture and it will keep absorbing like a sponge until it breaks free from where it's where it's nailed and it's going to crash through your ceiling <laughs> i went outside i said guys have you ever done this kind of thing before and he said and one said well i put a, a, a roof on my my uncle's barn the job cost $60,000, and a prepayment of $30,000 was given to Lorne. Lorne then requested another $10,000, and Betty refused, as he wasn't able to explain what he did with the first $30,000. She 
when did they give him the money for? Because he wanted, it was going to cost us 60000 He wanted half up front. That's business. Right. That does happen. Right. That's not unusual. Right. So he got it. But then he wanted another 10000 and I And I said, no, <laughs> no, no. What did you do with the money that you already had? Well, I paid my workers, but they didn't do anything. Mm. He says, well, I trust them. And I said, well, I don't. I don't even know them. The stress of renovating their house soon reached Eric as he had a stroke and soon after a heart attack. Eric had to spend lots of time in the hospital as well as attend speech therapy. Betty started to become overwhelmed as she had to deal with both her husband's health and the poor work being done by Lauren and his crew since Lauren barely did any of the work he was supposed to do. You've got this, uh, this situation now and uh, you've confronted him and all of a sudden these guys stop showing up. I'm guessing your first response is to try to call the guy up and ask him, hey, where are you? Now, this was when you said Eric had his heart attack. So, of course, everything goes on hold at that point. Am I right? Pretty much. Um, I spent most of the time... In, in the beginning, I stayed at the hospital. Yeah. Um, they released him 11 days later. He had a stroke. Oh, my goodness. At that point, they couldn't do anything at the Mayo Hospital here. It's not like the Mayo Clinic. It's not related to them. It's just called the Mayo Hospital mm -hmm. in Dover Foxcroft. They couldn't do anything for him. They, he had to go to um, Eastern Maine Medical Center. Actually, I'm sorry. No, he didn't. He went to uh, St. Joseph's Hospital first where they put in a defibrillator and, and um, pacemaker. Mm. But throughout, in and out of the hospital, most of 2007. Jesus. So at that point, you know, I would talk to him. I would go to the hospital. I'd, I'd sleep overnight, and then I'd come home, and I'd feed my animals, and so on and so forth. Um, it was tough. It was tough because I didn't know if he was going to make it. I really yeah. didn't. God bless you. Betty wouldn't have to worry about Lauren any longer, though, since he bolted from the job and never returned. His last day of work on the house was January 4th, 2007, and after the terrible job, Betty tried to contact Lauren through the DA to get her money back. Lauren felt ashamed for basically stealing all of Betty's money and promised that he would pay her back. On several occasions, he would even call up Betty, crying about how he's going to pay it all back. But of course, the money was never paid back in full. Because you do know, I think most of the folks know, I did, it, it wasn't like we didn't try. We went to the DA's office. The DA contacted, they have a mediator. Uh, the man's name was Ian McKinnon. He told Mr. McKinnon that he definitely would pay us back. We okay. agreed to take only 20000 hmm. pay it back. We were giving him a break because he didn't have, no way did he do $20,000 worth of work. Yeah. And um, and he said he would, and of course he did not. After about five months of constant hounding from Betty about the job, Lauren skipped town and moved from Maine to Nashville. Lauren will have you believe that the reason he put his septic company on hold, sold his house for $8,000 even though he had $50,000 in it, and lost his truck to a mechanic was because he wasn't in the right frame of mind or because he wanted to pursue a country music career, but truthfully, he just wanted to run away from the massive problem he created. I'm not kidding about that either. Lauren says that he relocated to Nashville to better his singing career. That seems kind of like a lie considering Betty and the large amount of money he has to pay back. In that same report, it says that Lauren had to put his company on hold, probably because he wasn't in Maine to actually run it. In Lauren's prison journal, he states that he sold his house for $8,000 even though he had $50,000 in it. When it comes to the truck he lost to a mechanic, the story goes that Lauren had to repair said truck and fix its damage, so he took it to a mechanic. The mechanic finished the job, but he knew who Lauren was. He demanded his payment, and Lauren said that he doesn't have the money, but he can give his stuff away like a TV to pay for it. 
the mechanic didn't fall for his trick and kept the vehicle. I also feel like it's important to mention another scam involving Lauren and a college professor. I'll let Betty explain this one. Just a, a professor in one of the colleges that worked at one of the colleges for about 20000 Lauren did, yeah. Um, can you tell us about that? I said something to him about, I was told to watch you, and now I understand why. And he screamed out a name. I know who it was. It was this woman, and he named this woman's name, whom I had never heard of before. Okay. She was the one that knew the professor. Okay. And he assumed that she told me that he stiffed this guy too. But she never did. I never knew who she was. But when he said her name, I said, huh. Oh. So I looked her up in the phone book and I called her. And I asked, I asked her, why does one think you said some stuff about him? And she said, oh, he did this work on, on, on the man's house and so on, what I just told you. So now I know. But she said that um, he was a different kind of guy. She Again, she didn't say too much about him, except he was a different kind of guy. Okay. S but uh, the vibe you got from her, I'm guessing, is she wasn't paying him a compliment in saying that. Am I right? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Betty was persistent, though, and continued to try to find Lauren and make him pay. After October 18th, 2007, though, no one would hear from Lauren for a very long time. This is a very troubling story, almost as troubling as the one before it. Lauren scammed an innocent couple out of $30,000 and just skipped town without paying for any of it. This isn't the last time we'll hear from Betty and this story does continue. For now though, we're going to have to move on to our final story. Can you tell us about that, about that phone call, about that message he left you? He was still here in, in, in Maine at the time. He was still living in the house. And there were a couple of times he called. I, I'm assuming he was he probably had a snoop full. And um, he would call. And not, not that I care. I like to, I like to tip back a few myself on occasion. So, you know, I don't care. But when you start calling people drunk and you start saying things, Hmm. Not a good idea, especially when he called that night, that particular night, and he was crying on the phone, as he always did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm so sorry. I feel terrible for what I did. I know I owe you money. I, I want to be friends. I'd like to invite you to dinner, but all I have is a can of peas. <laughs> I'm Path not making that up. Pathetic. That really happened. I have witnesses. Other people heard the message. Oh, man. Unfortunately, I don't have that message anymore. No, why, I mean, why would you... Other people heard, people heard that message and go forward, just like you did. When this incident... Given the popular title, The Mac and Cheese Incident, is our last story in this three-pack collection. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, Lorne praised and idolized his siblings to an unreasonable standard. This brings us to December of 2005, around Christmas time. One of Lorne's siblings needed work done on their house. Lorne used his A1 Septic Service business the same company that he would use to scam Betty two years later to help facilitate this construction. Unlike Betty's job, however, this one was actually completed, and Lorne calculated the price to be $700 total. Because Lorne is such a nice guy though, he tells his sibling that the construction job was a Christmas gift, and if they so choose to give him back a Christmas present, all he would ever want is some homemade macaroni and cheese. Around this time, Lorne would also cut the same deal for two other siblings. The second sibling's offer was exactly the same, $700 construction job that was completed and given as a Christmas gift. The only difference was that instead of macaroni and cheese as a suitable Christmas present, they were to make some homemade devil eggs. 
The third sibling didn't need any jobs done, but did need more heating oil. That totaled up to $425, and his Christmas gift back to Lauren with some homemade meatballs. Just so you know how crazy this sounds, I'll explain it again. Lauren did work for two siblings and gave heating oil to one. The cost for the two jobs was $700 each, and the cost for the heating oil was $425. Instead of paying the money that all three siblings owed Lorne, Lorne gave these things away as Christmas gifts. Then he said that if they wanted to give him Christmas gifts back, they could make him various food items. It was completely optional for his siblings to give him something back, and as you probably already have guessed, none of them chose to give a Christmas gift back to Lorne. Well, that's actually incorrect. Next Christmas in 2006, the first sibling did come through and give Lauren some homemade macaroni and cheese. The problem is that the sibling needed help paying for their child's Christmas gifts this year, and Lauren yet again cut them the same deal. $500 to help her pay for her children's gifts, given as a gift from him, and all he needed in return was some more homemade macaroni and cheese, which he never got. You may think that this is some stupid story, and it's insulting for this to be grouped together with the scamming of a married couple and the potential harm to two real children, but Lauren would strongly disagree with you. To him, this is an example of his state of mind at the time, an example of how mistreated he was, and an excuse for why he did what he did on October 18th, 2007. Alright, um, the... This example is one of the things that had happened to me that that made it so I couldn't, well, that was part of why I couldn't think straight. Um, one of my siblings, well, see, I, I idolized some of my siblings and uh, some others also. And I never should have done that, and I certainly don't do it, don't idolize them now. But this example is is probably one of the most disgusting to me. Um, one of my siblings needed some work done on the house, and and so I I I had a septic business at the time, and I was making good money, and um, so I took my crew up to their house, up, up to my sibling's house, and. Did $700 worth of work on their house and um, including paying the crew and, and all that. And I told them it was a Christmas present and if they want to give me a Christmas present back, then they can give me, um, make me some macaroni and cheese. There's some homemade macaroni and cheese that they made. And I did the same for another sibling. Went up. To their house, and I did seven hundred dollars worth of worth of work, um, including paying for my crew and and even using some of the materials that I had and all that. And I told them if if they wanted to, uh, it, that the uh, same thing that it was a Christmas present. If they want to give me a Christmas present back, they can make me some deviled eggs. And. Then another sibling, I, I gave uh, $425 to for heating oil and told them that if they want to give me a, it, it was a Christmas present, if they want to give me a Christmas present back, they can make me some of their homemade meatballs. And um, I never saw the meatballs, I never saw the deviled eggs, and I never saw the macaroni and cheese until the following year. My sibling came down with macaroni, with a pot of macaroni and cheese, and asked me to borrow five hundred dollars so they could get Christmas presents for the kids. So I, I gave her, I gave them five hundred dollars so that way the kids could get Christmas presents. And I, I told her you know, the same thing: just make me another bag, another thing of macaroni and cheese, and. Um, to this day, I've never seen the macaroni and cheese.
So here we are now, 2007. Hopefully you kept track of where we are and how we got here, but just in case, here's a quick recap of everything so far. On October 18, 1970, Lauren Armstrong was born in Maine. In 1989, he graduated high school. In 1991, Lauren joined the Air Force for one year and seven months, and after leaving the military, he ends up living both in Washington State and in Maine. In 2000, Lauren starts dating Amanda James. In 2001, Lauren opens his A1 septic service and construction business. In 2003, Lauren and Amanda James' relationship ends, lasting for about two and a half years. In 2004, Lauren starts talking to both MySpace Girl Number 1 and MySpace Girl Number 2 simultaneously. In 2005, Lauren did all that Christmas work for his siblings. In 2006, Betty and Eric moved to Maine, and in late 2006, early 2007, Lauren scams Betty and Eric out of $30,500. I also feel like it's important to note that Lauren also got an OUI this year. On August 6, 2006, Lauren got charged with an OUI, or operating while under the influence. On that day, Lauren was trying to pick up his drunk brother as he was roaming the town. Lauren, who was also drunk, got in his truck and according to the crash report, went off the road, hit a mailbox, hit the guide wires on a pole, drove onto someone else's yard, hit a ditch which sent his car airborne, and crashed into the side of a house. Lauren was sentenced to two days in jail and his license was suspended for 90 days. In early 2007, MySpace girl number two visits Lauren and they slowly stop talking from that point on. And finally, in the summer of 2007, he gets hounded by Betty to the point where he decides to skip town and go to Nashville, Tennessee to avoid his charges. Life has been one big roller coaster for Lauren. He's been through a lot as a child, served in the military, been in several relationships, all ending or being disasters, and now he's left all alone in Nashville. What's Amanda do in this situation? Maybe a regular person would try to pay back some of that money they're owed by getting a job, but we aren't talking about a regular person, we're talking about Lauren Armstrong, and what he does next will be anything but regular. In the next part of the series, we'll discuss what went down in Nashville, and discover the reason why October 18th, 2007 is such an infamous date for the locale.